hello and hello everyone and thank God we are here again. Thank you for joining us here on the code. I have my guest today. Her name is Judith Bradley. You can take care of yourself and still take care of others. Amen. And that is what we're talking about today. The topic today is healing the wounded healers. What is that all about? Anyway, that is what we're going to find out. You are in the car. Remember, we are here every Thursday at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. That is Texas time. Because when we are talking about Central Standard Time, a lot of people get this confused. We have some people. Daylight saving time in the United States, so therefore you really need to look it up because it does change. Also, if you want to be a guest on the show, please send us an email to info at illegalassociates.com. Oh, oh, and she would have, I know she has some amazing things. First of all, instead of her saying, I'm going to tell you the secret, she is from Panama too, to I am, and she can a voice to I do, but I her energy and she's going to share her dimples with us. So, <laughs> so tell us about Judith. Yes. Tell us about who Judith is and then tell us about this topic. How is it that it wants to make an impact in our life? Yes. Oh, who am I? I'm so many things that I'm so thankful to be. I'm a child of God. I am a daughter. I am a licensed social worker. I am a coach. I'm a minister. And at the core of it all, I'm a teacher. Um, I am so excited to be all of those things. And so today I really want to talk about what it includes and what it involves in terms of caring and, and, and providing for others who care for so many. I help those who are so phenomenal about helping others, but a bit poor about helping and taking care of themselves. We have a lot of, we have a lot of, so tell me more, so what is, I, I think I'm hearing my voice over here, again. You're hearing yes. yourself somehow, huh? Yes. Okay, I'm not so, sure where, where we're having the technology issue. <laughs> so, um, so tell me one of the first points that you want to share with us. One of the first points that I want to share is to really define what is compassion fatigue, right? Because you hear those two words put together, compassion fatigue. And compassion fatigue is that challenging time, moment, or season in someone else's life who provides care for others. Whether it's someone who's providing personal care in their home, someone who's providing care for others in their ministry, or someone who's providing care for others in their vocation or their job. And what happens to some of us is that we get so involved and so enthralled in doing that work that there's a period in time in where some things begin to shift or happen for us. That includes us getting very tired. That includes us having challenges in our sleeping ability. Um, either we're sleeping too much or we're not sleeping enough. That includes changes in our eating habits. And even in our moods, the, the things that used to bring us pleasure, we begin to lose um, affection and pleasure in those things or the reverse that is not often talked about, where we begin to get interest and find pleasure in things that either our values tells us that we are against or are not what we would call societally appropriate. So there's a period in, in, in some caretaker's life where that happens. In fact, it has happened twice in my life, over my lifespan, where I was so busy and running myself so much and things were so out of sync that I really lost um, the knowledge really lost the balance, that homeostasis, as they say, right, in terms of who I was and what I was doing and having things in the right order. So that's my first, you know, just thought that I would want to share with your audience is just being aware that this happens and then letting people know that no matter how giving you are, no matter how much you're serving, if that happens to you at a certain point in time in your giving, in your serving, it's okay and you're not the only one. So how does someone make it okay? Like, if, you know, right now, a lot of people that we are dealing with, they have low self-esteem, mm -hmm. but they have such a great joy in helping others, but those others take advantage of them. So they make you feel guilty if you decide, I am going to go to the salon and just take my, take of me. You know, oh, well, what about me? Well, tell us more about that. Oh my, what you brought up a very, very interesting word, guilty. Other and a whole phrase of others making us feel guilty. I think the reason why those 
those dynamics and those realities become true for us is because we are already feeling the guilt. Right? I always say no one can make you feel anything. All they can do is to fan the flames about what you're already experiencing. So if you are challenged and if you have already your identity wrapped up in being there for others, in doing for others, when you're not able to do that, even when you're making adjustments and changes in your life, you already are feeling the sense of, uh-oh, are they going to like me? Are they not going to like me? Are they going to be mad at me? Um, you know, are they going to look at me the bad way? Am I not looking like a good Christian, a good mother, a good whatever it might be, a good daughter? So you already are experiencing those things. So then when there's a statement or an attitude or a behavior that confirms those fears, you're like, there you go. There goes. I am all those awful things that they're thinking. And that's the perfect soil for someone to then just go right in and sort of stir up the seed of guilt and doubt and shame that we already have in those instances. Wow, I'm glad that you mentioned that. And if you are listening to this and you are having guilt, please don't make anybody make you feel guilty. The point is that we have such a great power and some people don't have that power that we have and when we then to share it with them, they want to make us feel bad because they feel bad about themselves. Absolutely. So tell us, the people that are listening to right now, what are, what are, what are I'm not going to say many steps because there's many steps we can take, but something that worked for you because I see your smile, I see this, this energy that comes out of you that is really positive. Mm -hmm. How can they become more of that and share that with you? Oh, Sandra, it hasn't always been this way. <laughs> You said something when we were speaking earlier that, that, you, that, that in our conversation, you could not only experience the beauty of God out here, but you were, it was evident that there's a beauty that was emanating from within. And not to say that it wasn't always there, but sometimes the, the realities of life, other people's expectations, and not putting things in order can sometimes um, in some ways cloud that beauty inside, even if you're still smiling on the outside. For me, it required me doing, the first thing I had to do was stop. Stop. Just stop. I know for some of us, that's almost like a four letter word, which it is, but not that kind of a four letter word, right? Stop, what is stop? We have, <laughs> yes, and you are so correct. Stop in the name of love for yourself, for your life, and for what else you're called to do. Because if you burn yourself out at the beginning of the stage, you're not gonna be able to fulfill your entire purpose. So yes, stop in the name of love. Love for your purpose, I love that. I'm gonna use it, but I'll give you, I'll give you the credit. Stop in the... <laughs> yes, Sandra, you have sparked, you see? Wonderful people inspire other people. I'm telling you, just gave me that inspiration. In fact, I actually did sing that song in college on Black History Month with another group, but that's another story. But we really have to stop and really take stock as to what's happening in our lives, as to the order of things. There's an order to things, right? There's an order in terms of even of love. We have to love God or, you know, our Creator. Um, and, and, we, and for some, some would say we have to love something bigger than ourselves. This, I won't get into that you know, philosophical nor religious debate. But there, you have to understand and realize that there's something bigger than just us being here. Then we have to love ourselves. Why? Because he created us. He created us. And, and, and there's a text in, our, in the scripture that tells us we have to love our neighbor as ourselves. Here's the reality. Some of us can't love our neighbor because we don't love ourselves. And some of us think that we're loving our neighbors, but if we don't love ourselves, what level of love really is that? So we have to love our neighbor, we have to love God, love ourselves, so that from that place of love, we can give to others. Not a place of duty, not a place of obligation, not even a place of identity, and not a place to, to win people's uh, rewards or their commendations or whatever, but from a place of love. So now, because of stopping, and again, you said one step, and that's just one of many. Because of stopping, I was able to sort of look, not so much without, but look within. Like, what's happening within this girl? What, what's going on? Why am I doing what I'm doing? I know I'm doing good things, and I was doing a lot of good things, but why am I doing it? Who am I doing?
doing it for? And if I don't do it, do I think I'm no longer lovable? If I don't do it, who's gonna still be around? Let me look, okay? So let me stop right now. I stop. Did everybody disappear? Wait, wait, so, oh, so all I was really wasn't a human being. I was just a human doer. So when I stopped doing, who stayed and who disappeared? So that was one of the first things I had to do, stop. Um, then there's some other things in terms of taking some time, um, and, and in terms of looking at a couple of areas of my life. The physical, and we can get into details of it as we move forward, but the physical, right? I had to look at what was happening physically, what was happening in terms of sleeping, eating, um, those kinds of things. I, I, I tell people, I had a bad habit for over 40 something years with my eating habit. No, I wasn't eating too much. I know it looks like I eat, but it wasn't that. It was I wasn't eating too, I wasn't eating sufficient, right? I was eating, going, running all day, going all day, and wasn't eating until about seven, eight, nine o'clock at night. Of course, we know what happens when you do that, right? And so we have to look at what's happening for us physically, Sandra. Then we have to look at what's happening for us intellectually, our thinking, our mindset, right? You do a lot of work in terms of speaking about that in your show. We have to look at our mindset. We have to look at some of our, uh, what, what, what I call in my field, stinking thinking. Right? Stinking thinking and how is that affecting the compassion and the service that we provide. Then we have to look at where we're at um, socially. Are we in a place where not only are we giving to others, but we have scenarios where others give back to us? Or are all of our relationships where we're the ones pouring out, we're the ones giving, we're the ones serving, and when we're exhausted and ready to fall back or fall out, there's nobody there to hand us a glass of water. And how much of that have we created by always, oh, I'm okay, I'm all right, I don't need anybody, right? And then when we really want somebody, we're like, you see, I can't depend on anybody. There's never anybody here for me. Well, did you create that scenario that said, Judith is always fine, Sandra is always fine, Judith don't need anything, Sandra doesn't need anything, only go to Judith when you want something, only go to Sandra when you want something? Or have we cultivated balanced, mutually reciprocating relationships that says, you know, today you, tomorrow me. Today me, tomorrow, tomorrow you. So we have to have a number of different levels of relationships. Those where we pour into others, we minister to others, we give to others. Those that pour into us, where we receive. And then we have to have mutual relationships where it's a give and take. So those are some of the preliminary areas and ways that I would say we can adjust and address um, compassion to teeth by taking care of ourselves. Wow, I, every, I, I cannot take away anything that you said because everything that you said was perfect. Oh, uh, gracias, hermana, gracias. <laughs> anyway, I know you have more to say to us because I want to, for you to give us some techniques of what you have done. You give us some ideas of what is it that's going on, what is it that we're doing. So now, let's find out how we can solve the problem. Right? 
Um, some of us are stuck on perfection. Believe me, I was one of those. And if it wasn't done perfectly, it wasn't done at all. And, you know, I've come to... Not anymore. Right, exactly, right? So we, we start out there, and, and that comes from a good place and a good intent, you know, a certain standard of excellence that you want to have. However, sometimes some things either are not within your control or they just happen. And you realize that people have told me, you know, because I'm very, I like things a certain way, I like it to be perfect. And it's been some of those imperfect things where I have let go of the reins, where others have said, you know what? It might not have been perfect, but it reached me or it showed where you were human, or it showed where you don't have to control everything, or I gained something from just seeing you not be so in control. And so even that is something that I would recommend to the, to the compassionate healer, to have moments where you, don't, you just proceed, you just jump sometimes, and you either fix it up or you improve things as you, as you go along, but you don't, don't necessarily have to be incapacitated or in any way frozen by the fact that something is not going to be perfect and then you're, you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting until you have it perfectly. Then some other things that I, that I, that I would suggest in terms of um, solutions in taking care of ourselves as the wounded healer, it's looking at things, I mentioned the physical, I mentioned the, 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 the intellectual, you know, in the, in the intellectual area, I would suggest trying new things, right? This is new. You've been doing this, I think you said since earlier this year. You had an opportunity before. This is new for me, right? In this way, I've done radio where they don't see you, but this combination of radio where they hear you and they see you, it's new for me. Uh, and so you just have to try new things because that expands your brain. It expands the opportunity. But if you're stuck and if you're forced in doing all the things that you have to do, then you don't have an opportunity to try new things, to expand your thinking, to expand and to try out new things that perhaps are new things that you want to do in your life or you might want to leave some of the old behind. Some people are just stuck in a rut and they just keep repeating the same thing over and over and over and over again and they never try anything new. So that would be another suggestion that I would recommend as part of, of intellectual self-care, trying new things. Then on the social level, as I discussed earlier, um, because one of the things that you said is people feel, you know, they have to do things. Mm -hmm. And yes, we, we all have responsibilities and we feel that we have to do things. But you have to get in the habit of doing things that you want to do, not because you have to do it. Like I always tell my kid, I don't have to do anything. The only thing I have to do is die one of these days and God is going to decide that. Nobody else. Mm -hmm. So I focus on doing the things them that I want to do and understanding that I have responsibility and I do those things then because I care, because I desire to do yes. things. And when you have a desire to do things and you know, you know, I want to do this because it benefits this reason yes. or that reason, yes. then you have, you, you are passionate about it. Yes. But if you feel that everything that you want to do, oh, I have to do this, then you are always going to feel guilty and then yes. you want to feel that everybody's taking advantage of yes. you. Yes, yes. No one is taking advantage of you. You let them take advantage of you. Absolutely, Sandra. Absolutely. Whatever we're doing has to come from a place of passion and a place of love. Again, you could be doing it and everybody on the outside, you're smiling and you're helping out. But on the inside, you're, you know, you're groaning or you're moaning. You know, you're like, I really don't want to do this. I don't want to be here. No. If you don't want to do something, just say no. Right? One of the affirmations that I have in my upcoming book, hopefully to be done by the end of this year for affirmations for leaders, you know, I call it that little drink of water for those who are pouring out into others. One of those affirmations that I have there is, don't say maybe if you mean no. Don't say maybe if you need, if you want to say no, say no. Say, you know what, I can't do this at this time, or this is not what I would like to do, or I'm not interested, period. And don't feel a need to give any explanation or any justification for saying no. A lot of times we say maybe because we're scared of what that other person's reaction is going to be when we say no. But say no so that when you do say yes, your yes comes with passion. Your yes comes with excitement. Your yes comes with love. And your yes comes with everything that you are. Not as, it's not just, you know, well, I'm doing this because I'm obligated to do. Why am I doing it? One of the things that I had to evaluate was to look at every busy thing I was doing in my life and ask myself the why. Why am I doing this? Am I doing it because this is what I believe is my purpose? Am I doing it because it's an obligation? Am I doing it because this is what I've always done? Am I doing it because if I say no, somebody will get mad? 
They will look at me funny. They will say, I don't care. They'll say, I'm not loyal. Why am I doing this? Am I doing this because I think that I have the responsibility to save somebody or save the world? I'm not here to save anybody. That's not my responsibility. I'm here to support others on their journey, but to save them, that is not my duty. And some of us have a little bit as, as caregivers and caretakers and service providers. We have a little bit of that savior mentality that can take us to the point of having compassion fatigue. And then the last place that I would say, go ahead. I love about what you said is because my, my conclusion of what you said is when you are clear about saying yes and when you say no, it's a no, you gain respect. Because if you feel that people are not respecting you, it's because you're wishy-washy. You are saying maybe and they are not sure when is it that they're going to get a yes from you. Too. So they're going to keep pushing, pushing until you say yes or no. So I noticed what, one thing that I have is that I am all about respecting people and they respect me. Mm -hmm. Because when I say yes, like she said, I say it with passion and I say it wholeheartedly. And let me tell you that when I say no, I say it with passion and wholeheartedly too. <laughs> so that way people are clear. They are clear on Sandra's boundaries, right? They know that when you say no, don't even try it again because it's a real no. That's right. And when you say yes, yeah. and that's it. <laughs> but when you say yes, they can expect with joy all of what you're going to bring because they know that it's coming from that place as well. So if I were to share some practical tips, right? Just five or six practical tips for the wounded healer as it pertains to their self-care. Here are some things that I would suggest to them. May I, Sandra? Here are five tips that I would share with them. One. This is yours. Oh my gosh, thank you. I'm coming back again next Thursday. <laughs> We're getting a do-over next Thursday. Um, one of the things I would say is find out or write down 10 things that you love about yourself that has nothing to do with anybody else, that has nothing to do with what you're doing for others. Exactly, exactly. From the outside to the inside to the things that no one can see. 10 things about yourself that has nothing to do with anyone. And look at that. Just look at that. That's one thing I would suggest because some of us don't know ourselves. All of ourselves, all of our identity is wrapped up in what we do for others, not in who we are. I already suggested trying something new, right? Trying something new. Uh, the third thing I would suggest, Sandra, and I know for some of us this is hard. Earlier I said we need to stop. Just stop. It's drastic, but that's the only way we can make a drastic shifts, shift in our lives. Because some of us have been doing what we've been doing. Oh, you just broke it down. It first has to stop with our thoughts, then it has to stop with our actions. So it, it requires both. Because if you're thinking about it and you never actually act on it, then what's the purpose? We have to start with our thinking in terms of, I have to do this. As you said to your children, you don't have to do anything. And when you realize that you don't and that you can just be, then that would translate into your actions where you stop. After you have stopped and you kind of work through that process, the next thing that I would recommend is give yourself some permission to have moments, not just stopping one time and then you get back on the same old horse or stopping because you went on a two week vacation, but work that into your life on a consistent basis. I have began to practice a very, very um, stringent Sabbath and it doesn't have to be on a Sunday, right? Everybody's work week is different but a Sabbath. And I would suggest to you that for your Sabbath, you stop for six hours, if you want to start there, then 12 hours, then 24 hours. 12, six hours, 12 hours, or 24 hours, where you stop and you spend that time relaxing, rejuvenating, reconnecting with yourself, reconnecting with your creator, reconnecting with God, so that whatever you do for the remainder of the other couple of days, it emanates from that place. And that includes for some of us, coming off social media, turning off our phones, all those other things that require us interacting and giving into others. And then the last thing that I recommend, if you, anyone is listening today, as they're looking forward to taking care of themselves as a wounded healer, is to do something for yourself that you have been meaning to do for a long, long time. Some of us will go across town if somebody calls us and asks us for something. But to do something for ourselves, it stays on the to-do list for three months, six months, a year, and sometimes never happens. 
Do something for yourself, I would say, before this weekend is out. Do something for yourself that you have been putting off over and over and over and over again. I think if you begin to implement these four or five steps, you will be on the, on the way towards being a healed, wounded healer. Yes. Because I believe that it's very important that we get people in the habit of writing things down. It always comes back to you. It always comes back because we get too busy. Oh, I want to do it tomorrow, tomorrow, and tomorrow is not promised to anyone. True. Just True. It's all you have today is the best day of your life. I Amen. That, and I take it to heart, and I hope that you do the same. So thank you, mi amor. Thank you, my love. You're so welcome. And you know what? I will not change anything in this presentation today so i'm glad that it's live because even though i was going through like this I, i'm glad because it it made it more fun yes it made it more fun yes and that's what i'm telling you any mistake that you make in your life i keep telling people be ready be willing to make all the mistakes that you can because that's how you want to grow. That's how you yes. want to learn. That's how you want to get stronger. Yes. I am the first person to make a lot of mistakes. Yes. Okay? All the time, every day. But I learn from them and I move forward. It's not about being guilty about what you did. It's being happy that you did something and you can move forward and learn from it. So yes. thank you for uh, yes, so welcome. Thank you for that experience. Thank you for smiling through all of this. <laughs> Um, share your dimples with us. <laughs> dimples. I am glad that they are real. Just like I was telling you, yes. people with fake dimples now. They yes. are real stuff. Yes. So be the real you. After you love your creator, love yourself, and you'll see how other lovers will also love you differently. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you, Mommy. God bless you. And you as well. God bless.